So um, thank you, everyone. I, uh, I thought it was uh, a terrific uh, seminar so far, and the, the voting process was fascinating. Um, it, it, it reminded me of when Senator Sullivan and I were both working in the White House about 10 some years ago, and there was a popular TV show in China at the time called Supergirls. And CCTV decided to let people vote for their favorite Supergirl with cell phones, and 72 or 3 million Chinese voted. And then they changed the format of the show. But I had a meeting the next morning with a senior official visiting from Beijing, and I asked him about it, and he said, well, it turns out Chinese people like to vote, and then changed the subject. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, you've had a great debate, um, and we're going to now uh, wrap up this uh, really interesting session um, by hearing uh, from a real veteran of um, U.S. Uh, foreign policy, defense policy, and politics on how we ought to think about our power, China's power, and the future of the Asia-Pacific. Um, senator Sullivan is uh, the eighth senator from Alaska. Um, he serves on four key committees, really a wish list for a first-term senator. Um, uh, in particular, on the Armed Services Committee, um, Senator McCain has put him on point for all Asia-Pacific issues. He's been very active. He worked in high levels of the Alaska state government before that, um, and in the State Department with Evan and others as Assistant Secretary for International Economic Affairs, Business, Environment, Energy. He worked in the NSC uh, staff when I was there uh, as a director in the International Econ Department. His main job was cleaning up the messes I made in the Asia Directorate, um, and he's a Marine, uh, decorated Marine, and a graduate of Harvard University. Uh, I called him once in Alaska, and he had a moose rumbling through his backyard. Um, he's unfazed by anything. He has three teenage daughters, um, uh, and uh, he's got a clear-eyed view of our interests in the Pacific. So it's a great pleasure to invite to the stage an old friend of CSIS and many people in the room, uh, Senator Dan Sullivan. Thanks, sir. Okay, thanks. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be back to CSIS. You guys do such amazing work uh, on so many issues. I, I always feel very honored uh, when I'm back here. It's great to see so many friends I've served with over the years and colleagues. Um, you know, one, one thing that's going to be a little different for me as a, as a U.S. Senator, you know, we have this arcane um, ranking system in terms of seniority. It's actually pretty important in terms of your assignments and when you get to do things. And so Mike was reading off my bio. He didn't put in there that, you know, I'm a freshman senator and um, my uh, ranking right now, you're looking at uh, the uh, number 100 out of 100 U.S. senators. <laughs> so uh, I think that that actually changes with the new election. So I'm going to go up a, a few notches. But, um, but uh, it's, like I said, really, really great to be back here. You, your work, the work of so many here, the scholars, the diplomats, um, it's so important to the work that we try and do. And um, I just want to thank you for that. Uh, we read up on what you're doing and try to get smart on the issues. So um, as Mike mentioned, I have had the opportunity in my career over the last uh, two decades to view the U.S.-China lens from a variety of different perspectives. State Department, White House, National Security Council staff, um, a Marine who's deployed out in the region, um, and as a, as a uh, state official, my state, Alaska, if you look at a map, we're not just north, we're way west. So we're an Asia-Pacific state as well. So, um, you know, these issues are incredibly important uh, to me. Now I, come, now I come and look at these position, these issues from the perspective of a U.S. Senator who uh, has spent a lot of time out in the Asia Pacific um, already on a lot of these issues. Um, but uh, there's no doubt that the issue of the rise of China is, in my view, the most important long-term national security uh, issue that the United States faces and how China is going to continue to work with uh, the United States and others fit into the international system or not is a critical issue. And um, perhaps because I've always been a, somebody who's seen the glass half full, um, I actually see a lot of opportunity right now and uh, in terms of that relationship, in terms of uh, the U.S.-China relationship. 
And I know that that goes against some of the conventional wisdom out there, uh, particularly after the election. Uh, I was with uh, CODEL just last week, led by Senator McCain to the uh, Halifax uh, International Security Forum. And I'll tell you, the, the officials there, there was a lot of hand wringing, a lot of uh, concerns about the collapse of the Western Alliance system, articles that you've seen, maybe some of you have even uh, written about how China is going to now move into the Asia Pacific with economic deals and trade deals um, and push the United States out of the Asia Pacific. And um, I'm not saying that there's no uh, legitimacy to some of these concerns that we've been hearing about, but let me, what I wanted to do this afternoon was propose a, a more um, optimistic vision uh, of what is happening now and um, an alternative view that's really not out there that much, but I think, um, uh, particularly in light of what happened uh, in our election, that there, that there are a lot of opportunities, and that's what I wanted to focus on uh, with regard to my remarks this afternoon. This afternoon. Um, you know, um, I've, uh, I've given this speech a lot over the last uh, couple of years, and it relates mostly to American audiences, where I talk about um, if you imagine the great powers uh, around a poker table. Actually, I gave, the first time I gave this speech, the next week, The Economist had the front page cover with the great powers around a poker table. I think President Putin didn't have a shirt on, um, but uh, it had the, uh, uh, all, the, all the leaders of the world around the table playing cards, literally poker. And um, if you think about that, and you think about what the United States, relative to any other country, brings to the, the table, still brings to the table in terms of our comparative advantages, um, we have a really good hand. We have a really good hand. Let me give you just a sense of what some of those cards are. Some of those aces are, which I think we still have um, quite a few of. You know, our entrepreneurship, our ability for a young American man or woman to come up with an idea and go to venture capitalists or go to the financial community and commercialize um, an idea. That's still something that we do better than any other country in the world. We talk about the high tech sector. You know, everybody thinks about Silicon Valley, but that's all over the United States in so many different parts of the country where we still, again, I think have a high tech sector that is the envy of the world uh, relative to any other country. Agriculture sector, fishing sector, you think of these basic commodities where, again, as a country, we still feed much of the world in terms of those sectors of the economy. Energy, something that I, is near and dear to my heart as an Alaskan uh, with a state that has enormous, enormous quantities of energy. Um, we are once again have become the world's energy superpower in terms of oil production, in terms of natural gas production, in terms of renewable production. Again, the envy of any country, but particularly countries in the Asia Pacific like China. You're starting to see because of that energy um, renaissance, low cost energy, a return, believe it or not, of manufacturing to parts of the United States. It still needs to focus a lot more uh, in terms of creating more jobs, but there's an enormous opportunity there. Our military, as somebody who still serves in the U.S. Marine Corps Reserves, I can tell you undoubtedly uh, we have the most professional and most lethal military in the world by far. No doubt about it. Alliances, alliances, allies, Again, you look around the world in terms of countries that actually trust the United States. You look at our system of alliances that we've created, whether in the Asia Pacific or in Europe or around the world, um, and we are an ally-rich nation. And most of our adversaries or potential adversaries are ally poor. Not many people wanting to join the Russia or North Korea club or the Iranian club. Um, and that's another comparative advantage. 
And yes, even you look at our Constitution and our system of government. Of course, it's a little messy. We just witnessed that. Not always pretty. But the transfer of power between one leader of the United States, the peaceful transfer of power, and another, uh, they don't know how to do that in China yet, and they certainly don't know how to do that in Russia yet. These are all enormous comparative advantages that I think we continue to bring, that we have at that poker table really, really strong cards, a strong hand. So what happened in November? There's been a lot of people talking about what's happened in November. This is my quick take for what it's worth. As somebody who wasn't up for election but campaigned uh, all over the country for a lot of my Senate colleagues who were up for re-election and election. Um, I think most Americans intuitively know this. They know what we have. They know that we still have all these incredible comparative advantages, and yet two-thirds of the country think that we are and have been on the wrong track. So that's a big disconnect. Well, what's the source of the disconnect? From my perspective, the source of the disconnect has been the U.S. economy. And I think the U.S. economy can explain a lot what happened in terms of our election in November. But if you look at the traditional levels of American growth, Democrat, Republican administration, it doesn't matter, for the last 200 plus years, the average GDP growth for the United States has been about 3.8, 3.9, almost 4% GDP growth. And sometimes it's much higher, right? In the Reagan administration, we're talking 45 five, five and a half percent GDP growth. The Clinton administration was also similarly very strong. But over the last 10 years, the last 10 years, our growth has been flat. We have averaged, the pre President Obama is going to be the first president, I think since we kept taking uh, historical numbers in terms of GDP growth that never hit 3% GDP growth in one year, almost never hit it in a quarter. 3% is not that great. It's not bad, but it's not that great. We've had a lost decade of economic growth. And I think what happened in November was that there are literally millions of Americans who started to believe that the American dream for them and their kids was starting to become out of reach. And that's different for us. The narrative of America is that every generation does better than the last. If you have kids, you know they're going to do better than you. And a lot of people, I think tens of millions, started to think that that was over. And I think that was the main driver of what happened in an election that I think surprised a lot of people. So since I came to the Senate a couple years ago, uh, I focused on this issue a lot. Every time we'd have a new GDP number come out, and 0.5%, 1%, these are the numbers. They're dismal. By any historical measure for the United States, I would go down to the Senate floor and ask, what are we doing? Where's the President? Where's the Secretary of the Treasury? What's the plan to grow the U.S. economy? And unfortunately, there wasn't a plan. There hasn't been a plan. This is one thing I've been very critical about with regard to the Obama administration, as opposed to saying, hey, we'll get back to 35 or 4% GDP growth. The line that you start to hear around Washington is, well, this is the new normal. Americans don't shoot for 4% anymore, or 45 or 5 you need to be satisfied with the new normal of one and a half or two percent GDP growth. That's the term, the new normal. That's what we should expect. Well, I think millions and millions of Americans rejected that in November. And this is where I wanted to start to talk about the opportunity. So how does this, how does this relate to the U.S.-China relationship? Why do I see optimism and opportunity coming out of this election. I think we have the opportunity to play the cards in our hand that I talked about in a much more strategic and forceful and strong way. So let me give you a few examples. I think that the incoming administration is going to be very, very focused on reigniting American economic growth. That's critical. 
And that's going to be a big difference from the outgoing Obama administration that did not seem to focus or to be perfectly blunt care that much that we are growing at 1.5% GDP growth. And as so many of you know, one of the most important coins of the realm of power in the Asia Pacific is not just military power, it's economic power. And we have not had that in over 10 years. I think if we reignite American, the American economy, and we can do this, that that's going to be a huge opportunity for us and our allies in the region. Let me give you a second example that relates to the first, energy. As I mentioned, we have enormous opportunities with regard to energy, not only for energy production in the United States, but dramatically expanding our economic and our energy security relationship with our allies in the region. My state of Alaska, we've been exporting LNG to Japan mostly for over 40 years. There is an enormous network that we can expand upon for LNG exports, for oil exports, to all of our allies in the region. And again, this is an area where the Obama administration, trust me, was not interested and the incoming administration uh, of President-elect Trump is interested. This is a great opportunity for all of us in the region. Let me give you one that I know it might surprise you in terms of an opportunity. Trade. If you remember, and a lot of people don't, eight years ago there was a President-elect who had campaigned on renegotiating NAFTA, was against the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement that President Bush had negotiated, was against the U.S.-Columbia free trade agreement that President Bush had negotiated. Do you remember the name of that candidate? It was President-elect Barack Obama eight years ago. He was the candidate against trade. Okay, what did he do? He came in, understood that this is important, is that going to happen with the uh, Trump administration? Who knows? But here's one thing that they have that no other president-elect has ever had. We checked this today. It's kind of an interesting statistic. This administration comes into office with trade promotion authority. What does that mean? That is really, really hard to get, the ability to actually negotiate deals, bring them to Congress on an up-and-down vote, most administrations have to work very, very hard, spend a lot of political capital to get that power. President-elect Trump comes into office with four years of trade promotion authority because we gave, we voted on that last year and gave President Obama that authority for 18 months, but now the new administration has that. Will they want to use that? It's a huge opportunity. No other president's come into office with it. I don't know, but I think that um, it's certainly a possibility. And then fourth, again, this goes back to, in my view, the most important comparative advantage we have uh, in the Asia Pacific, and that's this incredible network of allies. And again, um, as someone who spent a lot of time in the region, but has spent a lot of time in the region as a U.S. Senator, um, what we need to do, and I think we should definitely be doing this, and I do think the incoming administration will focus on this, is deepen our alliances and strategic relationships with traditional partners like Japan, like Korea, like Australia, like Singapore, but take advantage of the opportunities, and they certainly are out there, to reach out and establish stronger relationships with new potential partners. I had the honor of going to Vietnam uh, with Senator McCain, which was quite a trip to go with a man who uh, played a heroic role in our nation's history um, with what used to be an enemy of the United States. Well, you don't get the sense that it's an enemy of the United States now. You get the sense that this is a country that there's an enormous upside in terms of our uh, strategic relationship. That's just one example. I had the opportunity to have a discussion with the Prime Minister of India. There's all kinds of opportunities there to deepen our relationship 
with India. And so to me, the opportunities with regard to um, our alliances are also very strong right now. So what, what will China be doing with regard to these kind of issues? Well, you're the thinkers in the room. Uh, you're the, you're the uh, people who have focused on these issues. I've had the opportunity uh, to learn from many of you. You know, it was a little over 10 years ago that a good friend and mentor of mine, Bob Zellick, uh, talked about our hope that China's rise would lead it to become a responsible stakeholder. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that speech. I think one of you in the room actually wrote that speech. Evan. Um, but uh, is there still an opportunity there? I think what was very interesting about when that speech came out, I had the opportunity to travel to China a number of times as an assistant secretary of state with Secretary Paulson when he launched the strategic economic dialogue. And you saw the impact of that strategic concept where the leadership in China, in meetings that I had the opportunity to attend, Hu Jintao, Wen Jiaobao, Madam Wu Yi, they were all using the term responsible stakeholder in their discussions with American officials. And at that time, it looked like the direction of China with regard to its WTO commitments, when it was opening its economy, when it was meeting most of its commitments, that that was a concept that looked like it may take hold. Regrettably, I think in recent years, there have been signs that China has chosen to reject that idea. And there's been a number of experts who have agreed that they're going a different way. There was actually a, a book recently by um, Graham Allison and others on Pre, uh, Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew that had a number of quotes. And when he was asked about that, he's, he he's expressed strong doubts that China would want to move in that direction of a responsible stakeholder. And we're starting to see it. I think first in terms of economic policy, you know, in terms of WTO commitments. Right now you see China on a buying spree in many of our countries in the West, in the United States, particularly in Europe, particularly in Germany, uh, with regard to strategic companies. If American or Germany, German companies want to go to China and do the same, I think everybody in this room knows what the answer would be. The answer would be no. Well, we need to hold them to the reciprocal commitments they've made in the WTO. There's no doubt about that. And I think, again, with the new administration, you're going to see that. But secondly, with regard to the responsible stakeholder model and whether China is accepting or rejecting that, is obviously the increasingly uh, aggressive policy of intimidation and coercion that China is taking towards its neighbors in the South China and East China Sea and elsewhere. And I think most people here know what's been going on in that part of the, in that part of the world, but what was really striking to me was when The Hague came down with its verdict uh, recently with regard to um, many of the claims in the region, how quickly and dismissively China treated that ruling. And again, I think that that starts to build what Secretary of Defense Carter said at the Shangri-La Dialogue last year, those kind of actions risks erecting a great wall of self-isolation for China. And again, I don't think that's in anyone's interest, but certainly back to the issue of allies, um, you're starting to see many, many countries in the region wanting to have closer relationships with the United States because of those kind of policies. So let me end by just mentioning what's the end goal here? Well. I know that there's been a lot of discussion um, on Professor Graham Allison's recent article about the Thucydides trap. And I know some scholars don't necessarily like it or agree with it, but I'll tell you an interesting story from my perspective. I read that and had the opportunity to uh, have a discussion with 
uh, uh, Professor Allison, uh, before I had the opportunity to meet with uh, President Xi Jinping when he was in town here with a group, of, a small group of U.S. senators. And so I went down on the Senate floor and gave a speech on this topic and how we as the U.S. Senate need to focus on this longer term relationship between the United States and China and the rise of China and what Professor Allison said about the Thucydides trap and how the study of looking at situations in history where you've had a rising power uh, moving into an established international order generally has not turned out well. Whether it was the Pe Peloponnesian War in Athens and Sparta um, or other examples that he lays out in his uh, article. So I gave this speech, I talked about the Thucydides trap, and then I went in and had a meeting with the President of China. Interestingly, guess who raised the issue of the Thucydides trap in that meeting? Xi Jinping. So it was quite interesting. So I think there's clearly a common interest that we don't fall into that trap. And what I am arguing this afternoon is that if the United States, as a result of this administration change, can move into a position where we are unleashing our economic growth back to traditional levels of GDP growth at the three and a half or four or four and a half percent GDP growth, this will create opportunities. It will also help the U.S. engage China from a perspective of opportunity and strength. And I think that's critical. It's not only critical for us, it's critical for our allies in the region, and it's critical from China's perspective. Because, as I mentioned over 10 years ago in his responsible stakeholder speech, Bob Zelik ended that speech by mentioning this very issue. The trepidation is not the position from which the United States conducts its most engaged and important and successful foreign policy, but it's from a position of confidence. He said at the end of his speech, you hear voices that perceive China solely through the lens of fear, but America succeeds when we look to the future as an opportunity, not when we fear what the future might bring. So I think there are enormous opportunities here we're going to get to work on those in the Senate with the new administration, and I want to thank all of you again for all the great work that you do um, to keep us aware of the critical issues and to make sure that these kind of opportunities are the kind of opportunities that we seize in the international realm. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, and uh, thank you for agreeing to take a few questions. Um, I personally am very appreciative that you are very bullish about America. I am as well. I am. And I like the, I have always liked the term responsible stakeholder. Of course, we have this tradition in our country where you get a new administration and they don't like the terminology of the old administration. Yeah. But rather than ask you about responsible stakeholder, I want to ask you about a different um, uh, uh, phrase or uh, uh, term for a policy, not so much the term itself, but really uh, the policy. And that is the pivot or the rebalance. Yeah. So there's this new article out in the latest issue of uh, Foreign Affairs by our Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, uh, where he makes, I think, a very um, uh, forceful uh, pitch for how the rebalance to Asia has served American interests and why it should continue. Uh, of course, there are already some elements of it that maybe sound a little bit um, outdated, like yeah. TPP, right. <laughs> which maybe some of us are hoping will not be completely dead. And I think you hinted at that uh, in your remarks uh, as, a, as a supporter, I think, of uh, free trade. Uh, but if you evaluate the rebalance to Asia, and I know this is sort of a big question, um, what do you think that we're doing right? Are there ways it should be adjusted going forward? Is this the right policy uh, for the United States? Do you think this, this is something basically the Trump administration should inherit and 
if improve it, yes, or abandon it and do something else? What, what, what's working, what isn't? Well, when, I, when I've talked about, and you'll start to see a theme here uh, in my remarks, I think, but whenever I spoke about the rebalance, um, and I talked to Ash Carter about this quite a lot, is I talked to, I said, you know, the administration is focused on TPP, which is a trade component. And, um, and again, right now, after the election, I think that's obviously on hold. But I do want to emphasize what I emphasized before. Um, you know, uh, you do have an administration that's, if they want to do trade deals, uh, they have the power to do it. And no other administration has come into office with that power. And that's not to be taken lightly. But I, I always mentioned to uh, Secretary Carter and others, then you had the military rebalance, which um, was an element of President Obama's um, foreign policy that actually had the support uh, of the Congress. And that was important because, unfortunately, a lot of the uh, Obama administration's foreign policy and national security, you've seen real rifts between the executive branch and the legislative branch. And to be perfectly honest, a lot of those rifts were kind of partisan rifts, too, between Democrats and Republicans. America's um, strongest in terms of our foreign policy and national security when we have policies that are both uh, bipartisan, but also importantly, uh, that are supported by the executive and legislative branches. And I actually think that the rebalance in many ways, particularly on the military side, uh, was one of those policies. And that, I think, hopefully will bode well for it as we move into a new administration. Some of the other policies where you've seen a lot of dissension, the Iran, uh, you, uh, Iran policy right now, I think is very vulnerable because it did not have strong legislative support. And it wasn't a bipartisan policy. So that's a lesson, I think. Um, and then the third element I used to talk about in terms of a rebalance, and I already mentioned it in my remarks, was um, a rebalance in terms of energy. We do have this great opportunity with regard to energy. The United States now is producing more oil and more natural gas than Russia and Saudi Arabia. And by the way, this did not happen because of any federal government's policies. This administration actually uh, was not supportive of this. So um, my pitch to the Obama administration, Secretary Carter, was you need to include energy as one of the key elements of our rebounds. And to be perfectly honest, they didn't want to. And I think you're going to see a difference with regard to the incoming Trump administration, where this is an enormous opportunity for us for our allies, and even, you know, for China. If China wants to buy LNG from Alaska, well, we'll sell it to them. <laughs> right? This is a great opportunity. So um, I think, but on the military side, uh, you know, I, I just spent last weekend, again, at, at Halifax, Admiral Harris was uh, at that conference. And again, I think, um, we need to continue to focus on a rebalance of military forces in the region. There are certain areas where, you know, uh, uh, that there's a lot of uh, focus on. And we need to continue to do what Secretary Carter said with regard to the South China Sea, which is to fly, sail, and operate everywhere international law allows. And we need to do that with our allies. So um, I think it's been a good start. And um, I think particularly on the military side, you do have bipartisan and executive and legislative support on that. And I'm hopeful that the new administration will similarly be supportive of that. Okay, I'd like to open up the floor um, to questions. In the back. Uh, Please Senator, identify thank you yourself. Very much. I'm Tom Goldberg with Lineage Technologies. We do secure IT hardware. Cyber seems to be the uh, cross current of uh, concerns in the emerging trade disputes with China because they're closing their doors with their most recent cyber 
uh, statute that deals with security and safety, making it difficult for U.S. firms to operate there and to sell there. I was wondering if you could tell me how uh, the Committee on Armed Services uh, views these issues, uh, if you could share that with us. Sure. I appreciate it. Look, I think, and this is, you know, from open uh, testimony, but I think the cyber realm is an area, particularly from the armed services perspective, where there's uh, enormous concern. And I think it exists because, uh, you know, in a lot of realms in the United States, uh, from a military perspective, uh, still operates from the perspective of um, either military dominance or not having a near peer competitor in most spaces. I mentioned that as one of our comparative advantages. One space is one space where uh, that's not the case, where we have not only near peer competitors, but maybe uh, countries who are, are equal or maybe even have uh, advance beyond us is in the cyber realm. And I think it's an enormous concern that cuts across not only the military sphere, but our economic sphere. And in the federal government, whether it's a DOD or the broader federal government, we, what we need to do, what we must do, and there's a lot of ideas out there, is have a much better coordinated uh, approach to cyber issues. Because right now, it's not only kind of um, disjointed and extends throughout different parts of the military and different parts of the federal government, there's no real sound policy on how we even react, how we even deter um, cyber attacks on the United States. And so it's an area that needs much more focus. Fortunately, on the armed services, we're starting to get our arms around it, but uh, I think it's a uh, it's a very high priority for the committee and should be a high priority for the country. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so you have not asked a question today, so I'm going to pick you first. Okay. <laughs> People who have stayed all day should be rewarded. Thank you. Uh, um, I'm uh, Samira Daniels, Ramsey Decisions. Uh, um, I'm intrigued with how you've uh, laid out uh, uh, the uh, potential uh, direction of, 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 uh, the, of this particular uh, administration coming in. I'm wondering, though, um, do you think that uh, what, what would you uh, suggest uh, in terms of improving the, the negoti negotiation so as to tamp down the politics among the different alliance, you know, the, the, the politics among the alliances, not necessarily, you know, the bilateral, but the very complex dynamics that are occurring independently of us, and whether you think that the United States, and particularly the legislative branch, uh, can contribute in a, in a um, positive way. Well, look, uh, first of all, I, I'm, I'm certainly not here speaking on, the, on behalf of the new administration. What I, but what I am doing is um, highlighting areas where I think their clear focus is going to benefit not only the country, but um, our foreign policy and national security prospects in the Asia Pacific. And I can't emphasize enough the issue of growth. To be honest, as a U.S. Senator, when I came into the Senate two years ago, I was shocked at how little people talked about the anemic growth rate of the United States. Nobody talked about it. Nobody in D.C. talked about it. If you left Washington, everybody talked about it. The giant disconnect. And President-elect Trump tapped into that. Not only did he tap into that, I mean, some people have made fun of the Make America Great Again. I think it was a uh, a campaign theme that touched exactly on the issue of a country that knows we still have all these great comparative advantages, but to be perfectly blunt, many people, myself included, felt that our federal government was one of the biggest contributors to keeping us down. I mean, just in my state, President Obama, four days ago, decided he was going to take all Arctic um, oil and gas leases off the table for Alaska. What does that do? 
That hurts my constituents. It hurts our country. It hurts our ability to develop resources responsibly, which we do. It's the federal government hurting Americans. And, um, you know, I think we had to change that. And I think millions of Americans felt similarly. So I, I'm just talking about where you have an administration that's focused on these issues, economic growth. That is only going to benefit the United States and our allies and make us um, more confident as a country. And when we're more confident, I think we deal with these international issues in a, in a position of strength and we'll do a better job. Um, with regard to alliances, you know, certainly the U.S. Senate and the Congress, they, we play a role. I mean, there's obviously extreme examples of that. The Taiwan Relations Act was passed by the Congress, which still pretty much drives our foreign policy with regard to Taiwan, and that was passed over the objection of a president. So uh, particularly the Senate has a very important role to play with regard to our alliances, and I think you have most senators, Democrats and Republicans, who recognize that the system of alliances we have, whether it's NATO or the critical alliance we have with Korea and Japan and Australia and other nations in the Asia Pacific are critical. And I think it's important that you have the Senate that's supportive of that. Okay, Zhao Daojung, maybe you can tell us whether China would like to buy LNG from Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I've been to China pitching LNG to, uh, from Alaska. So it's not, it's not, it's not a hypothetical issue. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, at least two shiploads of uh, LNG from Sabin Pass Field has been arrived in China. That's great. Um, although we have BG, the British company, in between, why not, you know, China buy LNG directly from the United States? By the way, Alaska is much closer than the Gulf of Mexico, yeah, exactly, too. Exactly. <laughs> um, no, I, I wanted to make a quick comment and then ask you a question. Actually, speaking about um, energy trade between the two countries. It's not just LNG. China can need as much LNG the world can supply to replace this coal. Yeah. I always have this dream for the winter heating in China to just for the heating part to uh, for us to switch to LNG so that can reduce the smog and save so many lives. And on this point, I would really encourage thinking along the lines of vertical integration, meaning it's not just a simple sales relationship. We would want to encourage more intra-industry trade. Yeah. American companies, or for that matter, foreign companies, having stakes in the uh, downstream distribution. And uh, let's say you can co-invest in building the terminals and in the distribution market. And that helps to uh, uh, diversify uh, our own supply and also uh, encourage reforms of uh, the state-owned monopoly. So this certain there is an issue to work on. I, I do have a question for you to ask about the prospect of uh, the Senate voting on a uh, bilateral investment treaty between yeah. China and the United States. Of course, it's not concluded yet. We've had some 31 rounds of negotiation. Going back to Zhang Jinfu uh, coming to the United States 1982. Now, when this does come to the Senate floor, we do understand that much of the BIT between the US and China is the same as the investment chapter in TPP. Really, it's not very different. That's how the USTR does its business. And by the way, it also covers, can help cover some of the cyber issues in terms of market access. You know, what's he, the question for you is that it does require two thirds majority in the Senate for ratification what is the general mood in the Senate should the Chinese BIT come in, especially now that the TPP does not seem to be very uh, rosy? Appearing. Well, look, I, I think it's, a, it's an important question. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that I, I think can be a, you know, a, a very strong element of U.S.-China engagement is that kind of, um, is investment issues. You know, uh, I talk about opportunities. My state, as I mentioned, is very 
oriented towards uh, the Asia Pacific, because we are an Asia Pacific state. And we're also, even though we're a small state in terms of just population, with 730,000 people, we're, we're an export powerhouse. And our number one market used to be Japan uh, for Alaska exports. Well, now our number one market is China. So there's opportunity here. I think, and you know, in, in, in when I sp uh, spent a lot of time in China as part of the Secretary Paulson's strategic economic dialogue, um, one of the issues that I raised a lot was, you know, one way to deepen the relationship between the United States and China is not just have China come and buy companies or buy assets in the United States, but come over to the United States like the Japanese companies have done and uh, invest in green, greenfield investments, build factories, employ Americans. If you remember in the 1980s, there was enormous angst between the United States and Japan on um, economic issues. Of course, there still are, but one thing that I think happened during that time that was very positive was Japan came over and started uh, building Honda factories and Toyota factories all over America. And I think, you know, those two companies employ more auto workers, American auto workers, than almost any other companies. That's that deepens the relationship in a way that really matters. The bit is going to have problems if it's ever completed, though, on this issue of reciprocity, as I mentioned in my remarks. Right now, it's just obvious that when China wants to go buy a strategic company in Germany or somewhere else, um, they typically can do it. But if a German company or an American company wanted to go buy a strategic company in China, the answer would be no. And, you know, from my perspective, that's not, that doesn't comply with China's WTO obligations. And as long as there's a sense that the rules aren't treated the same, uh, I think you'll have a almost impossible uphill battle to get any kind of bit through the United States Senate. And so, um, that's going to need a lot of work. I'm going to give the last question to uh, Professor Wu Shitsun from the Institute of South China Sea Studies, who's also been here all day. So, um, and I think it's important for um, our friends from China to have opportunities to ask Thank questions you, to our members of Congress. Thank you for opportunity to raise question. Uh, Senator, thank you very much. I really enjoy your great remarks. Uh, as uh, Bonnie just mentioned, uh, uh, U.S. pivoted to the Asia Pacific region. Uh, I still remember uh, during uh, the 2012 and the 2013 Shangri La Dialogues, then uh, Secretary of Defense of the United States announced that the United States will deploy. Uh, it's 60% uh, of naval forces in the Asia Pacific uh, region by 2020. And the second year, uh, 2013, he continued to announce, yes, we are continue to deploy 60% of overseas air forces in the Asia Pacific region. So my question is, uh, from your perspective, will the next administration will continue to deploy the two percentage uh, for military deployment, uh, deployment in the Asia Pacific region by 2020 because the uh, United States has not yet completed this deployment. Thank you. You know, I, again, I, I can't speak for the incoming administration, um, so I don't, know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but what I, what I do, what I can mention or emphasize is where they, for example, have been with regard to um, defense spending. And uh, the president-elect and his administration have talked a lot about rebuilding our military. And I think we need, uh, my own view is I think we need much more defense spending. And um, one of the challenges has been with the current administration, we've been in kind of a deadlock. Whenever we have passed uh, defense appropriations bills that have tried to increase spending, the, the um, uh, the Obama administration has said we won't increase any defense spending until we uh, uh, increase at the same level domestic spending. 
Well, I think most Americans would agree that the Marines and the IRS or the EPA are not the same agencies and that um, not all agencies are created equal. And I think that hopefully we're now going to see a, a, a split in terms of this notion that we have to increase domestic spending whenever we increase defense spending. That's not where I am. Um, I think we need to limit some of the domestic spending and increase defense spending. So I'm only mentioning that because a decreasing defense budget, 60% of a, in the Asia Pacific of a decreasing defense budget um, is probably, uh, I think, is worse than, you know, maybe 55% of an increasing defense budget. And uh, hopefully we're going to see an increase um, uh, in the, in, in the uh, military spending. That's what the incoming administration has talked about, and I can guarantee you that's what a lot of members, not just Republicans, by the way, Democrats as well, um, on the Armed Services Committee uh, want to see. So uh, I'm pretty confident that that rebalance, um, just in terms of pure numbers, if we have more military spending uh, and higher end strength, in terms of ships and marines and sailors and aircraft and soldiers uh, will bode well. Well, Senator, um, let me thank you so much for taking time out of what I know is a very busy schedule for coming uh, to talk to us today and, and speaking on such a broad range of issues and uh, very in inspiring in, in a way. I'm, as I said, I'm very glad you're Are you optimistic on, now? on America. I'm more <laughs> optimistic. I think the U.S. Congress, of course, um, it goes without saying, plays an enormously important role in our political system. But I have to say, going forward, I think it's especially important. So you have a really big burden on your shoulders. We're going to look to you to uh, push through some of these really important things, starting with the economy, as you mentioned, yes. um, uh, increase in military spending, dealing with cyber challenges. We didn't have time to talk about North Korea, but I think that's also a big one. Um, and finding opportunities to work with China and maybe working energy into the rebalance to Asia. So it's a terrific set of ideas. I really want to thank you Great. for speaking. Well, thank you, today. Bonnie, and thank you, everybody, and all your good work. Thank you. Thanks. All right, good. Thanks. That's great. Thanks very much.